Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, for the folks who join us after we start, uh, we'll just you know go back through some of the questions and repeat things if needed. So let me begin by introducing myself. My name's Eric. Uh, I am a former USCIS adjudicator, and I am a former uh, Department of State Consular Officer. Uh, currently, I work for Boundless Immigration, a company based in Seattle that helps guide people through the immigration process. The purpose of this uh, conversation today is just to talk a little bit about some of the uh, information that I learned in my career as an immigration professional, and also to you know, hopefully answer a few questions and demystify the process for folks who are going through it, um, which is kind of what we do at Boundless. Uh, I do want to reiterate before we start that I am not a lawyer and I am not a current government employee. So please do not take anything that we discuss today as legal advice. This is all just general information drawn from my past experiences. This is not official government policy, nor is it legal advice about your particular situation. Okay, so uh, we do have some questions teed up to get started. Um, I'll kind of start big picture. I'll go through some of the different questions we received. And then if you have follow-up questions, uh, I have a colleague who's working with me and monitoring the chat. He will communicate those questions to me and we'll try to answer those as well. All right, so uh, let's get started. So one of the questions that we got that was kind of a big picture question was why are processes taking too long right now? What is going on with USCIS? Well, USCIS, as you all know, is part of the Department of Homeland Security, and they are the agency that's primarily responsible for adjudicating the common immigration forms related to, uh, in particular, green card status. So uh, in the case of USCIS, you know, like a lot of big organizations in the government and private business, uh, they have experienced a lot of hardships during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, uh, they have offices located all over the country. So just like a lot of local businesses and things like that, they were impacted by uh, state restrictions on interaction and office activity during COVID. Uh, they had localized outbreaks. Uh, a lot of the government, so not a lot, but there were government civil servants that passed away as a result of COVID. And uh, you know, they, the US federal government has to follow the same rules that everybody else does, which meant quarantines, which meant you know, uh, sick leave, office cleaning, deep cleaning, you know, shutting down operations for certain amounts of time, depending on uh, workplace safety laws. Um, in addition, the massive drop in applications during uh, the early, you know, four to six months of the COVID pandemic uh, severely impacted USCIS's budget, meaning that they didn't collect the fees that they normally need to collect to continue operating. And they faced a budgetary crisis that existed until they were, they had an opportunity to begin restarting their operations in the late summer and fall. So I, I think those two things more than anything else had a massive impact on USCIS. They led to large delays and the accru accruing of large backlogs. And uh, you know, I, I don't say that to make excuses and, and every, every organization you know, is, is required and, and it's needed for them to plan ahead for emergencies. But uh, we all know the COVID pandemic was unprecedented. And um, you know, as a person who did work at USCIS during parts of that period, I can say that the professionalism and uh, hard work of a lot of the civil service uh, employees and adjudicators at USCIS did minimize the impact as much as possible and, and, and tried to keep things on track. So uh, the system is working, petitions and, and filings are moving through, people are getting uh, their, their claims and, and applications approved. And, um, you know, there'll continue to be disruptions uh, as a result of COVID, as we've all seen, but um, it, it, it is functioning and they are increasing their capacity every day. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll move on from there. Um, there is another USCIS question. Uh, it, it, the question is, if employees have, you know, for, for, the, for the, the, the question says, Employees at USCIS have been working from home during the COVID-19 period. So why, if they are still able to work from home, has the uh, petitions and applications taking, still taking a long time to process? I think the important thing to understand in this question is USCIS is still mostly a paper-based agency, meaning that when you file your forms and paperwork, they get submitted to the government as actual like physical documents. And in order to adjudicate these documents uh, and these, these, these applications, that paper document has to be moved around the United States to the different offices that process the documents. 
So in a lot, of, a lot of cases, this was not as big of a problem when everybody was working in a central office, that paperwork would go to Office A, then it would move to Office B, and then the, the, the adjudicators in Office B would have a chance to, to review the application and bring people in for interviews. It becomes a lot more difficult when every single person working in every office is working from home because then you have to not only move the documents and paperwork to the appropriate office, but also put it in a queue for that individual officer to take home, look at and process on their uh, telework time. So uh, that factor alone meant that it was much, much slower and more difficult to get final uh, decisions on these applications because even if it then was looked at, at, during, at somebody's home during the telework period, they had to bring it back to the office, review it with the supervisor, take other actions, uh, and it just uh, extended the process. So uh, that, that, that aspect, you know, unfortunately, because of the way the government and the immigration system works, uh, telework is not optimal for a lot of the work that adjudicators do at USCIS. Okay, um, there was a question about bias. So uh, one, one, uh, one of our followers asked, have you seen bias, uh, racial, ageist, et cetera, in the department? Give examples. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have worked in both the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I worked around many talented Foreign Service officers, many talented civil service professionals. And I can say with full confidence that, that both agencies and the federal government in general are one of the best places to work if you care about these issues. Because the government has made a concerted effort to promote awareness of uh, diversity and inclusion principles. They have made specific programs and efforts to, to reach out to and recruit people from different backgrounds. Uh, there's a strong recognition among the leadership that these types of efforts and the input and knowledge and experience that comes from diverse uh, group of employees is valuable to the agency and helps them do their job better. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to put too pretty of a face on it. You know, every, every human being is different. I can't say that I did not hear about or uh, in some cases directly experience things that could be certainly, cert if not discrimination, then certainly bias. But uh, a framework exists in uh, the U.S. government to address these, these concerns, these incidents. Um, they have counselors. They have uh, uh, places that you can go outside of your chain of command or your individual uh, office where you can raise these issues and enter arbitration and, and get some kind of uh, uh, support from the government, uh, even if it involves somebody who's your superior or who you know, has a lot of power relative to you. So I, I personally feel it, you know, that the, it, the government is doing a good job in this respect. There's always better, there's always more work to be done. Uh, there's always a, a way to do better, but they're focused on it. And um, I think if this is something that is important to you, then the government is a good place for you to look for opportunities. Okay, getting down into some of the more specific questions here. One of the questions was, how long does it actually take to go through the K-1 visa or green card application? So the K-1 visa process and the green card application process, so that's the immigrant visa process that takes place when the uh, relative or spouse or you know, what we call the beneficiary of the immigration petition is overseas waiting for permission to enter the United States as a green card holder. Um, the two processes are different, and it's really hard to make general statements about how long the process will take right now because uh, the impact of COVID has increased backlogs and processing times across the entire U.S. immigration system. In uh, normal times, you know, uh, perhaps summer 2019 or before in recent years, you know, a K-1 visa may take six to eight months to reach uh, the interview stage. Um, you know, the, the paperwork for the petition was sent into USCIS. Uh, that, that application was looked at, uh, you know, in most cases approved. The information would be then be sent to the National Visa Center, who uh, works with the individual consulate where the beneficiary is located to schedule the interview. And um, one of the reasons that people were interested in the K-1 process uh, in recent years, again, before the disruptions caused by COVID, was because it is a relatively faster process to get your actual fiancé here to the United States. And also for a lot of people, it's important that they have the wedding that they want to have and don't just get married, even legally, just for immigration purposes. Now, the immigrant visa process takes longer. Um, and I think in most cases, people, again, prior to COVID, 
would get this process done in 12 to 14 months, meaning that they would be interviewed and issued a visa so that they could enter the United States. Uh, the other possible scenario is your adjustment of status process, which is what happens when a beneficiary is in the United States and they want to go from whatever visa status they had when they entered the United States to a green card status or permanent resident status. That process also takes you know, around 12 to 14 months in normal times because it takes time for the application to work its way through the processing, uh, you know, a roadmap for USCIS and land at the field office where the interview can be performed. The interview with the adjudicator in most cases being the last step before the green card is adjudicated and issued. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a quick pause here and just ask my colleague, uh, if we want to shift gears or do anything different, we have some additional follow-up questions that have come in, so uh, let me address one or two of those, and then I will go back to some of the questions that we had originally. Um, there was a question from one of the folks on the, on the live. Why is it difficult to speak to a service rep at USCIS? Long wait times to speak to a person. I wish I had a better answer to this question. Uh, you have to keep in mind that millions and millions of people are going through this process at any given time in the United States, many of whom are overseas, many of whom are in the United States. Um, and uh, people have a lot of questions. And this is why a lot of people seek legal assistance or assistance from an organization like Boundless to guide them through this process is because uh, it's not clear. You know, and I, I worked in the government for many years, and I can tell you uh, very frankly that you know, it, it, this is very difficult process for somebody to navigate on their own. Um, and that is exacerbated by the fact that USCIS does not provide a very efficient or uh, customer friendly way for people to reach out and ask questions. Now, I will come to their defense in one respect and say that many of the questions that people have about this process, USCIS is not in a position to legally answer because they require, a, you know, a legal relationship, you know, usually between the person who's applying and a lawyer, just in the same sense that you wouldn't ask the IRS questions about how to, you know, tailor your taxes a certain way. You would not necessarily want to go to USCIS to ask about things specific to your case. Um, it, now, that's not to say that they don't have a responsibility to answer more basic questions about, like, how do I fill out this form or what is going on with my case now that I have it submitted or why is it taking so long? But, um, you know, for better or worse, they have not uh, reached a level of customer service that people are satisfied with in that respect. I know that there are plans in place right now to change that and make this more uh, accessible and make it easier for people to get answered to their questions. Um, and I hope that that continues. But uh, for the time being, I understand that that's something that people are very dissatisfied with. Uh, another follow-up question. As a green card holder, holder, can I petition my parents and what is the process? So yes, uh, there are some differences between what a green card holder can do in terms of petitioning for relatives and what a um, person who has a U.S. citizenship can do. I think everybody uh, knows that process. Um, so I, I really don't think it's productive in a short call like this to get into like very specific visa types and things like this. Um, there is some information online. Uh, for people, uh, if you do a simple search for things like LPR petition for parent, you'll be able to find like some basic information about how this process would work. It does sometimes take a long time, uh, a little bit longer for people who are not U.S. citizens to receive permission to bring over their relatives. Um, in the case of, the, uh, you, of an LPR spouse, that may not be a big difference, but for parents and brothers and sisters and stuff, it can be a long wait because the U.S. government does set quotas on how many people non-citizens can petition for and bring over uh, through the immigration process every year. Okay, um, there's a question, does calling your representative put pressure on expediting? This is a, a question that a lot of people inside government have too. Uh, by representative, I assume you mean your congressional representative or senator. Um, which is, uh, you know, a right that uh, U.S. residents have to reach out to their representatives, both state and uh, district level, and ask for assistance with processes that involve the U.S. federal government. Uh, I know some people who have had success with reaching out to the representative. Um, it varies a lot by the individual representative. Some representatives are very good about what we call constituent services. Other 
senators and Congress people are less focused on that part of the job. Um, I think uh, it's worth exploring for people, especially people who have encountered uh, longer waits or waits that are outside of the normal processing times based on USCIS data to at least, you know, reach out uh, to your congressperson and talk to them about what you're experiencing there. Even if they can't provide direct help, that's the only way that they will know about what is happening with their constituents. Um, in some cases, uh, I do recall when I was working overseas that Congress people and their staff would, would reach out and ask about visa related questions. And we did respond to that and help them understand, you know, what was going on in that particular case. You do need to make sure that your congressperson has authorization to reach out on your behalf. So, you know, they will need to share your information with the government agencies that are processing your case so that they can get more, more, uh, specific answers for you. But yes, that is an option for folks who are going through the immigration process. Okay. Um, we'll do one more of the follow-up questions. There was a question about, will USCIS ever go virtual? This was a big topic of conversation during the coronavirus pandemic, especially as we looked at different ways to get people back to work at the U.S. government agencies and field offices. Uh, I will say that uh, I was involved in some of the USCIS efforts to create a space for virtual interviews. Uh, I was also involved in several projects to digitize and involve, uh, digitize the paperwork involved in the immigration process. Uh, which would mean that you would be able to file electronically. You would not have to send in physical paperwork. Uh, for digital filing, USCIS come a long way. Currently, uh, they do have a, a method for you to file I-130s, uh, I-485s, and uh, citizenship applications in 400s uh, via digital format. Uh, they have a custom software, proprietary software interface that they use to adjudicate those applications virtually. And um, in some cases, that can lead to a lot faster adjudication for people who submit that way. Uh, unfortunately, that's not an option for everybody, and some people have uh, cases that have been pending for a long time that you know are in paper form and will be adjudicated that way. For the virtual interviews, it's still a topic of conversation. Uh, I know that there has been some limited um, work done uh, to, to accommodate people who are concerned about COVID issues. For example, having an officer in one office and then having a uh, applicant uh, sit down for their interview in an office across the hall using a uh, video link to conduct the interview. Uh, whether people will eventually be allowed to conduct these interviews virtually while on telework uh, is, is kind of an open question that's being discussed. There's also people who are looking at um, possibly adjudicating uh, cases from one office via an officer at another office that's less busy. So perhaps somebody in Seattle could appear for an interview and then an officer in Yakima or Spokane, Washington could uh, virtually conduct the interview while they work, while the applicant is in the Seattle office. So uh, in both cases, um, there's there's some potential there, but it's not quite ready for prime time. I would recommend people keep an eye out. You may uh, encounter a situation where you're asked, if, especially if you're early in the process, to participate in one of these types of programs. And if so, uh, I recommend you do so. USCIS could really use your feedback to help understand the pros and cons of, of these kind of approaches. Um, I will make one other point uh, regarding consular interviews overseas. There has not been any serious discussion that I'm aware of for uh, conducting virtual interviews for folks who are outside the U.S. Uh, the State Department has taken the position even recently in conversations with the American Immigration Lawyers Association that there is a legal requirement to conduct an interview and have those pa that paperwork signed in front of a consular officer. So for those folks who are working uh, from overseas to complete this process, the outlook is, is a little bit less uh, likely that you will get an opportunity to work with the Department of State and conduct a virtual interview that way. Okay, um, looks like we're doing pretty good on time. Um, I'll go back here and talk a little more about some of the questions that we received before. Um, so there was a question, and I think this is a great question. If you have a criminal record, will your naturalization be denied? So uh, I think in order to answer this question, I need to explain something about the naturalization process. When you go for your naturalization interview and when you submit your naturalization application to become a U.S. citizen, the U.S. government uh, is primarily looking at a period of time called the statutory period. So for most people uh, who are applying for naturalization, that will be the five years immediately preceding the time that you filed your, your N-400. Now, if during that time you committed what is called an unlawful act, so in the five years preceding your application, you committed an unlawful act, 
you committed a crime for which you were charged and found guilty uh, for the most part. Uh, that's not uh, a guilty finding is not necessarily required for them to look at these unlawful acts. But in practice, a lot of times that is kind of the thing that determines whether it gets looked at as an unlawful act or not. Uh, so uh, a common scenario that I saw was a, a DUI. So somebody has a DUI within the last two years. They're applying for naturalization. They come in. The record is otherwise fine. Uh, they have no other serious crimes on their record, but they were uh, convicted of a DUI and you know perhaps had gone through the different steps to, to resolve that. Um, yes, that is looked at as a potential problem on your application. And what uh, the USCIS adjudicator is required to do when you have any unlawful act on your application within the statutory period is to do what they call a balancing of factors, which, said, which means that they look at the potential negative impact of your unlawful act, and then they measure it against other factors in your application, such as your community service, your integration in the community, the period of time that you've lived in the United States uh, as a permanent resident, um, you know, some of your involvement with different organizations in the community. Um, sometimes people send in testimonials from their friends and family members attesting to the, the level of character that people have. And that information is all kind of put together and uh, an analysis is performed to determine whether on balance, you know, the U.S. government believes that giving citizenship to that applicant would be a positive uh, step for the United States. And that the larger context in which that is considered is what they call the uh, uh, the um, general mor uh, good moral character requirement. So the law says that f people who want to become U.S. citizens have to demonstrate good moral character. And I mean, I, I think maybe that feels a little anachronistic to folks, but uh, you know, it is in the law, and part of how they quantify that decision is by looking at unlawful acts and and weighing them against. The positive factors in the application to make a decision about that particular legal question. Okay, and uh, one other thing I'll mention is uh, the statutory period is actually different depending on uh, who, under what basis you're applying. So for spouses of U.S. citizens, um, or, or sorry, uh, yes, for spouses of U.S. citizens, they only have a three-year statutory period, meaning that they can apply for uh, naturalization three years after they receive their green card. So that can work to their advantage in this case because you know, if you had a criminal incident that occurred four years ago, but you're married to a U.S. citizen and applying on that basis, then in that case, you can uh, basically ignore that that year four issue and just look at the three years before you apply. Now, one other thing I'll mention is there are some serious crimes that will be uh, prejudicial to your, your naturalization application, even if they occurred 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, going back to my DUI example, like if you have a pattern of DUIs that occurred throughout the 10 or 20 years before the application culminating in a DUI or two DUIs within the statutory period, yes, that could present a serious problem for you because that's a pattern of behavior that uh, could impact the, general, the good moral character assessment in a, in a way that's quite different from like a one-off event or one mistake that you made. So uh, please be cognizant of that. And if you have questions about this, these issues, I, 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 in particular where it relates to criminal law and how it could affect your naturalization, I do recommend you speak to a legal professional as they are the ones who will have the background knowledge and training to uh, make a, a legal finding or, or help advise you on these issues. Uh, okay, so um, there's a couple questions on here about the green card interview. Um, I'll, I'll read a couple and kind of try to roll them into one in the interest of time. So one of the questions was, did you ever do a marriage-based green card interview? If so, have you denied any? And there was another follow-up question, how long, do, how long do green card interviews last? So I, uh, I actually performed green card interviews overseas at U.S. consulates and, in that case, an immigrant visa interview. And then also at the Department of Homeland Security, USCIS, I did those at a field office. Um, I think what most people are probably more interested in is the USCIS process. Um, USCIS, uh, you know, if you're in the, in the United States, they'll move your case uh, at the point it's ready for interview to a field office, and you'll be scheduled for the interview, and you'll appear before a USCIS adjudicator. If you have a lawyer, they can join you for that interview. You can also bring a translator uh, for green card interviews um, who can assist you if you're not you know, speaking English is not a requirement for, for adjustment of status. To a, to a legal permanent resident. 
So you may have a few other people in the office. You're you're, you're together. You know, you're you're in a room with a, with an adjudicator. He has your file. He or she has your file. They've looked over it. Um, they have some general idea about how they want the interview to go. Uh, most of the time, the interviews last about 20 to 30 minutes. And during that period, uh, they do three things. One, they'll go back over your application and make sure that all the information that is on there is up to date and correct. Then they will go over the eligibility criteria and make sure that there's nothing that you answered on that portion. These are the questions like, have you ever killed anybody? Have you ever been in a paramilitary group? You know, some of these things are going to seem a little strange, but I guarantee you there's people out there who say yes to every single one of those questions. And, um, you know, any eligibility issues that arise during that period of the interview will be looked at. Uh, and the officer will discuss with the applicant, you know, what kind of things they're going to need to overcome those things if possible. And then um, finally, there's a more free form element to it. You know, the final part of the process usually, for, especially for marriage-based green cards, is, is kind of a conversation where you say, well, you know, how did you meet? You know, tell me more about your relationship. You know, what, what are the major events that happened in your, your, your relationship up till now? Um, you know, uh, what's going on with your living situation? Um, what kind of things do you like to do together? And this is just so the adjudicator can get a sense of, you know, your relationship, the rapport between you, um, the, the, the background, uh, that knowledge that you have, how comfortable you are with each other. So, uh, that, you know, is a little strange sometimes for folks because it's, uh, it could be a little personal, it could be a little private, but you know, the officer is just asking these questions because this is how, the most effective way that they can make a decision about your case with the information that they have available. And, um, you know, after doing hundreds of these interviews, you do get kind of a feel for folks who are genuinely in a relationship versus people who are perhaps, um, trying to portray themselves as in a relationship to get that, that immigration benefit when in actual fact they're not. And going, going to the question about denials, I would say the vast majority of denials for folks are because of, what I said about ineligibility. So there are people with criminal background, with immigration, you know, problems in their immigration history, um, people who have been involved in different activities um, that, uh, if not necessarily illegal, are uh, contrary to the interests of the U.S. government. And when those cases, when when those cases are encountered, in a lot of case, in a lot of scenarios, it can be very hard for people to overcome those things and get waivers and get exceptions so that they can ultimately get their green card. So uh, when there is no, no method for somebody to get an exception or a waiver and they have an ineligibility or an inadmissibility in their, in their case, um, they will be denied. Um, to a lesser extent, you do see folks who have what appears to be fraudulent marriages. Um, when those are encountered, usually it doesn't result in a denial right away. The U.S. government will make some attempts to try to go further to verify the relationship um, they do have investigators that will do what they call site visits. So they'll come out to your house, try to look at where you live together, make a determination about like, does this look legitimate, like a married couple, or, you know, does it look like one or one or both people live somewhere else? Um, it's not an exact science, but usually what they do is they try to collect enough evidence to say one way or the other, um, whether those, that is actually a legitimate application or not. Okay. So we're running out of time. Uh, I want to do one more question. Um, let's see. Let's let's stick with the interview thing and, and talk about there's a question. So give me some advice on the marriage interview, please. So I think this is a good one to end on. So based on my experience uh, conducting interviews, and I, I did I did many many non-immigrant visa interviews. I, I did many immigrant visa interviews. Uh, adjud adjudicated many cases at USCIS for green card and citizenship. And I would say the biggest thing that can get you in trouble in the U.S. immigration system is not telling the truth. You need to always tell the truth about your circumstances and the information that you're putting on these forms. Because if there's one thing that the US government, civil servants and foreign service officers and consular officers are good at, they are good at sniffing out false information. Why? Because they do tens of thousands of these interviews in their careers. And over time, you know, you, you kind of see everything. And for folks who have a strange, you know, scenario or a strange job, or uh, are not, you know, doesn't don't appear to be telling the truth about their circumstances. It can be obvious very quick to a trained adjudicator that there's some kind of issue there. And the worst thing that you want to do in the U.S. immigration system is put yourself in a category that is getting looked at more closely. You know, because when you get to that, not only does that cause potential problems for you, but it can cause a lot of delays 
uh, once you get put in a you know sort of investigation basket or something along those lines, you may not even hear about your case for another four to six months as it works its way through it works its way through that system. And I, th I think one thing that I saw, especially with tourist visa applicants and doing those interviews, is a lot of times it's people getting in their own way. You know, they took bad advice from somebody who was not a lawyer, perhaps a notario or perhaps a family f family friend who wanted to help but didn't have the right information, and they put themselves in a position where. You know, even though it wouldn't have harmed them in their application to tell the truth, because they put false information on their application, they get refused or they get denied or they get put in a basket of, you know, misrepresentation or fraud that they really didn't need to be in if they had just stuck to the facts. So, uh, you know, and I recognize that people are nervous about things and they want to avoid problems, but, you know, there are waivers, there are exceptions, there are, there are, there is adjudicator discretion. And if you have a problem and you tell the truth about it and you put it front and center so that the adjudicator or the consular officer can can think about the right way to handle it, you have a much better chance of getting a waiver, getting getting your issue you know, uh, resolved. Uh, you may still have to wait a little bit, but you avoid that 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 major landmine in the system that I see, which is the the fraud area. And, and people who put themselves in that fraud area is very hard to get out of because after that, everything that you put in front of the government will get looked at and questioned in a more in a, in a more concentrated way than it would have uh, before you, you 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 were involved in that incident okay so i'll kind of stop there uh i know people have tons of questions i hope this was useful for folks um we're happy to do this again if there's interest uh i want to thank everybody for your interest and for participating in this event and if this information was valuable to you you know keep the information coming keep the questions coming and we will try to make sure that Boundless continues to be a great resource for you guys to get those questions answered. All right, so uh, I'll kind of stop there if, uh, if my colleague here thinks we are good to go. All right, so thank, thanks again, everybody, and uh, look forward to talking again soon.